Yeah, you did have a little ambient noise there. Yeah, my son. All right, everybody. Welcome to Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. I'm Brendan Baylot, your host and the administrator of the Great Lakes Shipwreck Research Group here on uh, Facebook. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our show tonight. Um, I think it's, boy, it must be coming up on our 10th episode. We've been doing this a while now. And uh, we've got a great show for you tonight and a really, uh, a really good guest. Um, this is um, Mark Sprang is our guest tonight, and he is uh, the archivist from one of the most important repositories of Great Lakes shipwreck material in existence. And you're going to learn a lot about it tonight. It's going to be a great show, and I'm really, really excited to have Mark with us. So, Mark, uh, welcome to the show, and thanks so much for agreeing to do this. Sure, no problem. So, uh, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, we've got uh, uh, a, a real uh, great guest next week uh, on the show. Somebody who is a real, uh, you know, foundational person in the world of Great Lakes maritime history who's done uh, just about everything from soup to nuts, and that's Valerie Van Heest. Uh, Valerie is uh, one of the founders, I think, of the Underwater Archaeological Society of Chicago, but then also the, one of the founders of the Michigan Shipwreck Research Associates. She has been involved in just about every aspect, from underwater archaeology to wreck hunting to uh, storytelling, and now uh, in historical and museum interpretation. So real excited to have Valerie next week, and uh, please make sure to join us for that show. Um, a special thing we've got going on tonight, uh, by popular demand, we're going to have an after-show chat on Zoom. So I've invited uh, all of you who uh, want to to join us. Uh, there's a link in the comments uh, after the a couple places on the site on the, on the group now there's a link to join us in the zoom room it's an open zoom room and uh, you can feel free to come on and join us for the chat tonight it should be a lot of fun um and then uh, i also want to remind everybody about our youtube channel uh so obviously you know things scroll down off the uh, facebook page after a couple of months and you don't get to see them anymore even though they're recorded up there um I post all of our shows and all of our, our video content also on our YouTube channel. And that gives you an extra added benefit that if you want to share those things outside of the group, you can. So feel free to check out our YouTube channel. I've got it linked all over the place up there. Um, and sometimes I post stuff on there that, you know, I don't post on the group. So, so check it out. Um, also, I want to uh, just give a shout out if anybody out there, you know, who's doing interesting work uh, with Great Lake Shipwrecks, wants to be on the show, give me a holler. Um, you know, I'm real interested in, you know, maybe people who, who who nobody knows, but you're doing some really interesting stuff. Maybe you've done some cool research. Maybe you found a new site, you know. Um, maybe you've got some family history you want to talk about. So give me a holler. You know, I'm interested in getting some other people on the show. So uh, let's move on to, uh, to, uh, to Mark. Uh, so, Mark, um, boy, uh, what a treasure. What a treat to have you on the show. I, I, I've got a lot of connections to Bowling Green State University, not the least of which the, the best hockey game I ever saw in my life was between my alma mater, Michigan Tech, and the Bowling Green State University Falcons for the WCHA championship a few years ago. I was there live up in Houghton, two overtime, two sudden death overtimes, and Tech pulled it out with um, seconds to go. It was just Stunning. And I'm also a big fan of Bowling Green's uh, hockey team. So yeah, very good. I get down there sometime. Also, my partner, Gina, is a, a, a former <laughs> Bowling Green University Falcon and uh, started playing hockey down there. She's the goalie on my hockey team now. And um, so we, uh, we like Bowling Green State University. But mostly, uh, I'm a big fan because of the marine collection there. Uh, what an amazing resource with a, a really serious background. So, Mark, why, why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about how you, uh, about your background. How did you end up at Bowling Green? How did you get interested in history? And, uh, you know, you've been posting a lot on the group. You seem, you know, in, in just a few years, to have really amassed a, an impressive fund of knowledge about Great Lakes shipwrecks and maritime history. How did you do that? I can't share my trade secrets. Um, <laughs> um, I always had an interest in archaeology from a young age. Uh, we made so many trips up to Fort Michelin-Mackinac there, and I would always go bug the archaeology students about what they were doing, um, and also visiting museum ships as a kid. So mm -hmm. I had family that moved to the upstate of South Carolina in the 
mid 70s. So we've been going down there every year since I was a baby, since before I was a baby. Uh, and they have a, over in Charleston, they have Adrian Point, which is they have the USS Yorktown. So it's one of four preserved aircraft carrier museums. Which, as a side fun fact, the two archivists for Patriots Point have their offices on the aircraft carrier with the HVAC from the Vietnam era. So that's exciting. Um, but they have a 50s submarine. They have a destroyer that survived 10 kamikaze attacks. Uh, so I love going on the ship museums. Uh, I went on the Valley Camp when I was in, I want to say middle school. Um, but I always was a history nut. So that's what I went to school for. I didn't do the teaching part. I did the basic intro to teaching to see if that's what I wanted. And nope, <laughs> I kind of, I kind of teased the current parlance. I noped out of there. Um, so, but you know, what do you do with a non-teaching history degree? So I found a job at a CPA firm for a few years, and I thought, well, you know, I want to go into archives. I know they're a thing. How do I? So I stumbled on the Society of American Archivists website, and then they have their list of their favorite graduate programs. And since I'm from Gladwin County in Central Michigan, uh, I chose Michigan U of M for in-state tuition, which is great, which it's still expensive because it's U of M, but, and they can. Uh, so that worked out great. Uh, so for my internship there, you're required to do a summer internship full-time for 10 to 11 weeks. So I applied to the Naval History and Heritage Command out in Washington, DC. They're on the Washington Naval Yard there. So I was working in the photo archives there for the summer, which was fan. I was unpaid, which is even more fun. So when the <laughs> civilian staff were furloughed, I still got to go to work and be babysat by a chief, uh, which luckily he was interested in the collection because it's a fantastic collection there and it doesn't have the publicity that it needs. Now they have actual archivists working there. And I learned, that's how I learned about glass plate negatives and how I learned about panoramic photographs that were so popular in the late 19th and into mid 20th century, we'd have the ship at the pier and the entire crew is along it. Uh, so you'd have, you know, let's say an 800 foot battleship had 1500 crew members. So you'd have them all in the picture and then you'd see people like sitting on cranes and things. And uh, so that, cause I would, cause I knew I wanted to get into sort of a sub area. I mean, I would be comfortable in any archives but I wanted to find a subject matter I was interested in. But, and then after I graduated, I got a three month stint at the Dawson in Detroit, the Dawson Great Lakes Museum. Everyone go visit if you haven't. Um, so that was a great experience. Basically, I was locked in there by myself on weekdays to sort of go through their archival collection in this array that it was. Um, and then my first full-time job was that fall. Work, in 2015, I started working for the South Carolina Department of Archives and History. So I was a, a digital records archivist for the state of South Carolina. Um, but my wife and I didn't want to stay there forever. We're from Michigan. So this job popped up at just the right time. We've been pregnant for a month at that point. Uh, it's three and a half hours for my parents instead of 15 and a half hours. So it just worked out great. Bob Graham, the previous archivist here, he did 28 years. He retired in 2016. And I was so happy I got the job. Uh, and they even told me afterward, my coworker said, yeah, you're the only candidate who had any subject matter, prior subject matter knowledge. So that put me over the top of everyone else. So that's what I tell some of our students that come in to work. I said, you never know when some side interest or hobby might help you with a job someday, because it certainly did for me. So they were just, because they had other qualified candidates, but no one that seemed to have the passion for the materials. So it's been an uphill battle. At least Bob is still lives in Bowling Green. So I consult him regularly. And sometimes people still email him because they haven't talked to him in 10 years. So they don't know that he's retired and then, <laughs> so that was kind of the, I kind of had a convoluted path to get here, but I'm so glad I don't work directly for state government anymore, especially there. So I won't go into the politics of uh, uh, the pay structures of Southern state governments, but suffice to say, they're not great. At least the cost of living was low and you're two hours from the ocean, right? Um, right. So here in Bowling Green, it's, we're both small town people. So this is nice because we're close enough to other places and yeah, it's been really fun. So, Mark, your your passion for the subject matter is really apparent to those of us on the group. Um, a lot of times, you know, and I can tell you, we can all tell you from personal experience of walking into an archive and talking to a disinterested librarian or asking somebody a question and they're like, you know, really put out by it. And you're coming on our group and actually, you know, doing lookups for people, uh, uh, you know, that's really unprecedented, and we're so fortunate to have you. Um, and, and I think the, the, the HCGL is really fortunate to have you too. 
Um, I can't, uh, it's just a real breath of fresh air. So thank you so much for, for what you do there. Um, sure. All I can say is partly the more Facebook engagement is partly due to the coronavirus situation since we're working from home. So it's finding new ways to uh, do outreach. I mean, we have to record every query that we answer and social media isn't even a source that we can select when we fill out the web form. So that's going to be changed because of me, actually. So because uh, we have our own institutional ones. But my boss said, yeah, go ahead with your personal one, find those subject interest groups and kind of go to the people because I see our images floating around all the time. So because they used to they have that uh, um, watermark up on the upper right that says yeah. historical collections of the Great Lakes. So I'm like, I've seen that picture. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, you know, that that's a, a, an amazing collection there. I've used it many times. It's, you know, got so much information about Great Lake, you know, antique archival photos and accounts of shipwrecks and just, you know, so much data from the 1800s and, and, and even before. How did it end up in a place like Bowling Green uh, State University at Toledo? And then I also noticed there's the library, there's the Center for Archival Collections, and then there's the Historical Collections of the Great Lakes. And I know there's a lot of, a lot of history behind that. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the backstory and about the uh, the library and the collections? Oh, there? yeah. So uh, BGSU was founded as Bowling Green Normal College in 1910. So we in Kent State were founded in the same year by the state of Ohio to train teachers for our parts of the state. So here it was to train all the the teachers for all the schoolhouses out in the farm towns and the uh, railroad towns out in Northwest Ohio, because it's very flat. So it's it's ideal railroad country. And the especially Wood County where we are used to all be swamp back in the 1800s. So that was the first big industry here was drainage tile actually to drain out the swamp. So it was, if anyone's heard of the Toledo war, part of the reason that the militias didn't meet is because they couldn't get through the swamp to get to Toledo from here because it was impassable. There was one crappy little plank road going up. Uh, so um, when they didn't start grading advanced degrees here until the 60s, so that's when it became a university. So that's why our architecture is awful because it was most of the expansion was done in the, the architectural dark age of the 60s and 70s. No <laughs> offense to architects out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not a big fan of that building, are you? Uh, the artwork is cool. Yeah. Uh, the artist intentionally designed it so that you can't define what it is. So we're several other pieces of his on campus as well. He was an artist in residence in the mid to late 60s. So he'd go out with his hard hat and just do it. Um, yeah, the building was, this building was built in 1967. Uh, we had, let's see, our administration building opened in 1967 and the ice arena here also opened in 1967. So a lot of stuff was happening here on campus. Um, so, the collection started originally the great lakes were the first archival collection that they had here surprisingly so a young man whose name was richard wright uh he got his doctorate in history from kent state in 1968 i believe he did his dissertation on the history of american shipbuilding company and its predecessor companies which he then expanded into a book called freshwater whales that some of you might be familiar with oh yeah uh, so he got a you can tell it was a long time ago because he was 28 and got a tenure track teaching history job here at, at BGSU um, wow. in his late 20s. Uh, and he was a Great Lakes nut since he was a kid. So he already had amassed a decent collection of books and photographs, postcards, pamphlets, all that kind of stuff that he brought in. So the core of the collection was his stuff only. So it's nice in our in our catalog. If there are any books that were part of his collection, they added an extra note that says this was part of Dr. Wright's original collection. Um, and then we were expanded to also include the history of Northwest Ohio. Uh, so general history, genealogy, government, local government records for the 19 counties in this part of the state. And then they also started the microfilm program in the early 70s, which is still active, which is great. I should add about Rick, right? You know, um, you know these all this vessel data we have, the vessel enrollments. Uh, that's all because of him. Um, when you use the vessel enrollment microfilms, you'll see on there it all says uh, Rick Wright on the films because Rick is the one who ordered them made at the National Archives. And, uh, and so many of these things we take for granted, this vessel data that we use when we research shipwrecks, it's there because of Rick Wright and because of the collection. Yeah, he did a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I'll talk about one of his math, massive newspaper binder project later because that was all him too. Um, 
So he was the head of the, ar the archives in all areas, but the Great Lakes, of course, were his baby. And finally, they brought in other archivists so that he could be a subject specialist and just kind of worry about the Great Lakes materials. And he knew everyone everywhere. I mean, even at, at one point, he was even the president of the Toledo uh, Shipmasters Lodge here locally, even though he had never served on a ship in his life. <laughs> so that shows you the influence that he has all those guys that just kind of knows everyone it's like oh yeah I know Captain Bob or uh oh yeah I remember that longshoreman I met down there in Cleveland I see him we talk all the time when I'm over there uh and he was not he was willing if he heard about a collection he was willing to drive there himself and get it so our very first manuscript collection collection number one is Chicago Shipbuilding Company one of those Amship subsidiaries so that goes from late 19th century to the 1960s when they closed it so I believe he went over there and got it before anything was being done to it. I can't confirm nor deny that these happened because I, there's patchwork records from that time. So, but that was our very first one. Uh, but he passed away unexpectedly in 1987. So he had had heart problems before that. Uh, he was 51, I believe, 52, 51 when he passed away. His wife is still here in BG. I have yet to meet her, but I'm making Bob, his predecessor, his successor will make sure that happens because I want to meet her. So, and she donated other materials of his that they found later, like some, uh, some Amship letterpress books from the 19 teens, which are fantastic, that kind of stuff. Um, more of his books, more photos, surprise, he had more in his basement. Uh -huh. uh, and they hired Bob Graham as the next archivist and he was here from 1988 to 2016. And then I started in August, 2017. So I'm third person in, over 50 years. So it was a long legacy to live up to. And a lot of people I work with, researchers I work with knew him. So, so HCGL is a subset. I'm the subject specialist for the Center for Archival Collections, which is all those other subject areas, the history of the unit. We have someone who just does university history, Northwest Ohio history, the microfilm, someone who does, they're called our student affairs collections. So those are individuals or trade groups related to professionals who work in higher education. So there's, as you can guess, there's an association for literally everything. So there's the college treasurer's group and the vice president's group and the health center's group. And so it's all that kind of, and you know, administrators and things. Okay. And then the library, we're just one unit of many. There's a music and sound archives. There's a pop culture library, a uh, juvenile uh, literature and curriculum library because education, especially special education is still, I'm glad after 110 years, that's still one of the main programs of the university is to treat your training. But but it sounds like the the Great Lakes stuff is really there because of Rick Wright, right? I mean, yeah, it was his driving force. Uh, okay. Supposedly, the one of the previous deans in the 90s really wanted to get rid of it because she didn't see the point. Uh, but luckily, the I believe the ACGL site, the subsite of the library site, is the yeah. second most visited site on the library, other than the main page. Why because I think of the geographic area, if you're just thinking about where we have things from, it's the Gulf of St. Lawrence to Duluth and the connecting canals. So that's a huge geographic area. Everything else is very specialized to like this region of the state or to the university. So that's why whenever we get to, whenever we record queries, you always put where the people are from too. So I can say, yeah, I had one from the UK. I had a model builder from the Philippines. I had, most of them were Michigan, of course, but. So, Michiganders are really intense about this stuff. Sure. So you, well, mentioned, the, you mentioned the search stuff. Uh, why don't you show us some of it? The, 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 we had a few of guests from other museums and, and archives that have shown us their, their websites and search interfaces. Bowling mm -hmm. Green's got one of the best in the country. And particularly for ships after, say, 1880, it's wonderful. And the thing I like about it is there's a really good picture of each vessel, excellent history, and it's a lot more than just ships. Uh, I uh, I constantly am going to this site. It's one of my go-tos, one of the three or four go-to databases for doing uh, not just vessel research, but research about the people who are on the ships um, and the ports. So um, Mark's going to give us a little... Uh, yeah, I'll do the share right. here. <laughs> here we go. Now I'll just uh, make us uh, go away. <laughs> and here you go. There we go. Is it showing up correctly? Well, you're showing the Facebook. You were going to show the website. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Oh, you're so, showing, yeah, I'm sorry. You're showing the PowerPoint. You were going to show the website. Yeah, let's not show the PowerPoint. Huh?
Here we go. Give it a couple seconds. Your screen is not presenting. Oh, hey, look, it's a folder. Okay. No, that's not the. Do you, would you like me to bring up the website, Mark? Well, I'm trying to figure out why it's uh, not showing my win web window here. Let me try this one more time here. I'll right. do another share again. There we go. I didn't tell it to share Chrome. There we go. That's what I want. Uh, give it a couple of seconds, and uh, here it is. All right. Well, I'm sure some of you have probably either happened upon or. Uh, have used this site before. So it's just a subset of the university library's uh, website. Uh, the easiest way, I mean, there's, there's the URL up here, but the easiest way is just to Google HCGL. Fortunately, that is a very, very uncommon uh, acronym. So it's very, very likely that this will be the first result that you get. Uh, and we made it a point to put the, uh, there's some information here, kind of some statistics about, oh yeah, we have this many collections and this many images, um, what's in the databases. Uh, but one thing I want to point out right here is our catalog search. So we have a book library of around, I know it's over 2,000 titles, uh, both old and new. Many of them Brendan has featured on some of his videos as well. We don't have as many originals as Brendan does, <laughs> but uh, a lot of them are uh, either reprints uh, and other things that you might be used to like merchant vessels of the United States and things, but try to cover as many subjects as possible, not just shipping and maritime history, but also environmental history, folklore, music, um, uh, maritime history, education, uh, things of that nature. So the catalog has almost, almost all of our books. And then also what we call pamphlets, but it could really be anything. It could be a cruise brochure. It could be, um, you know, a parts manual from the 50s. Uh, it could be a product, ca uh, you know, vintage product catalog, a dissertation, a research paper, a, or an article that we've excerpted from, a, you know, maybe a non-Great Lakes periodical, for example. So it's great when you're trying to find an article and find out, oh, someone already did this and extracted it and made it easy for us to use. So like, if I put Brendan's last name in here, which you can tell by the autocomplete I've already done. Uh, it's like, here we go. Brendan's Great Lakes Record Report from 2014 to 2015, and then his book Fathoms Deep But Not Forgotten, Volume One. So that shows you what we have. Um, I mean, no copies of that. We're still around. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. Well, and the one downside is because uh, we're, we don't circulate the books like you'd be able to do at a regular library. So what I usually can do is almost all publicly accessible libraries have a a shared catalog on a site called WorldCat, which it, it checks where you are and it shows where the what you're looking for is where, by location, how close it is. And a lot of times you can probably get a copy from one library loaned to your local one so you can pick it up and get it. So I've definitely done that for some for some people. If someone says, hey, could you scan this 300 page book? And I can say, well, you know, Western Reserve Historical Society is 10 miles from you and they have a copy so you can go there and use it. So. It's not just what we have, it's also knowing what other tools there are out there that we can help search. Let's see, so we'll do the vessel database. Now this was just refreshed last year, which is great because not because before you couldn't use it on your phone or your tablet. So if you wanted to fill in a field, you had to use your fingers and zoom way, way in, fill in the thing, zoom out, go to the next. It was oh, real. No. It hadn't been updated since 2010. So that doesn't mean I have to go out there and, 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 and harvest it again, does it? No, I'm sure it'd be pretty easy actually to just like extract the flat database if you really wanted it. So I've added more stuff to it, a lot of records to it. Cool. Um, so you can search by vessel name. Uh, it's uh, any name, whether it's the later one or the original. The only thing that's kind of wonky is you would need to use the last. If it's the name ship is named after a person, you would use last name, then first name, like a phone book. So you'd follow it that way. You can go by where it was built, whether it's wood, iron, steel, composite. Uh, was it a prop? Was it a tug? Um, are you in there right now, Mark? Huh? Are you in there? Oh, right now? I forgot. You have to. You have to tell it to share every time you change a tab. All right, here we go. There we go. Every time you change a tab, you have to share. I'm used to that now. Okay. So you can just do a general search of everything, or you can fill in different fields. Or sometimes, if I know it's a ship where there's been a ton of ships by that name, if someone says, "Hey, do you have anything on a boat named Huron?" Uh, yes. 
what's the official number? Oh, it's this. Okay, good. Because as you might guess, there's a lot of ships that were named here on. Uh, and then you have some of these drop downs, ever, uh, which I had our web developer do some things to. So you can set a date range. You can say, oh, I want to see all all vessels built in Lorraine from 1900 to 1910, or all vessels more than 500 feet long, or something like that. How many masts that they have? You can do that as well. So we tried to, do, or you can just browse, which is a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to go to one of my favorites. So it gives you a, it will give you a nice list, and you can either click on the name or the picture to go in there, and it shows you the official number when it was built, so you can tell what it is if it's the right one without having to actually click in every single time. Um, so this was the USS Rich. It was a destroyer escort built in World War II, and it was the only Allied ship sunk at D-Day. Uh, it had, yeah, it hit three mines off Utah Beach. So as you can see in this picture, it broke off. Now in the old database, we used to only have one photograph per vessel, and we have way more than that for a lot of them. Uh, for example, like the Wilfred Sykes, we have 57 folders because we have all the original construction photographs from American Shipbuilding Company. So for this one, for example, I was working with a curator of a destroyer escort music ship museum in uh, Albany. They have a one of the only ones left there. Um, so he's also helping me identify some of the interior spaces, which is great. So now I can put multiple images here and you can click on the image. And if we know where it was taken, you put it there, if there's any kind of captioning on it, we make sure that's there as well. And you can click back to get back to the record where you were. Uh, so that's she very built, uh, And she was built at Bay City by default. Huh? Yeah, DeFoe yeah. shipbuilding in Bay City built in a, that's the only reason they survived. They used to build motorboats and uh, luxury yachts. And then in World War II, they started building patrol boats and destroyer escorts. And they kept that up until probably the seventies. They survived on small naval US Navy contracts. Very cool. So that was part of that big drawdown of Great Lakes uh, yards in the 60s, 70s, 80s, because uh, Defoe was there. It was 76 years, I think. So it was Wisconsin very fortunate that they still have domestic shipbuilding there. I didn't realize that you had multiple images up now. I'm going to have to go back and re-research this database now. This is really cool. It's only for a handful, because I have to add everyone individually and do the metadata for it. But now that we have the ability, that would be great. Because back when they made this database, it was the late 90s. So graphics weren't great yet. And they only had enough budget for one image per ship because there were 8,000 vessel entries to start with. Because this includes vessels that were built on the Great Lakes but didn't serve here too. So like all those Lakers from the World Wars, naval vessels like the Rich here, um, or other ones that were built for ocean service, or ones that were built on the ocean and then were converted for Great Lakes service. Because there were a number of those, of course, after the war. All these extra halls sitting around. Sure. Can, you, can you bring up a Great Lakes shipwreck? See what kind of data it shows for one that was lost here? Oh, yeah, of course. Let me go back. Let's do the one I know of, the Wexford. That was one of the vessels lost in the storm of 1913. Yeah. So this will have the basic information if we knew it. Uh, what it's And everything is by the original name of the vessel because they've had so many names. Uh, there's always which country registry it was when it was built, what official number it was, the rig, all the particulars. If it was had any rebuilds, this also includes uh, if it was re measured, not necessarily converted, or when it was converted from coal to diesel oil or something like that. And there's sometimes there'll be a history field if there's some events that we know about what happened to it, like, oh, it ran aground here and released. That's a lot more common in the 19th century entries where you'll have a schooner that ran aground 10 times before it actually sank the last time. Um, those are a fun joke at work about. <laughs> how, many, how many how many how many sailing ships did this new steamer split in half after it was launched? Um, and then it has disposition if no if we knew what happened to it if it was scrapped where it was because so many hulls were scrapped overseas too in Turkey, Taiwan, uh, places like that, Spain. And it says, oh, it had a cargo of steel rails. It was upbound to Lake Huron. It was sunk in 1913 with all hands. And then we have the builder information where we got the information from. So some of them I'll put Metzler, the Metzler database in Wisconsin because it's more better for these older vessels. And then other places that it may have been registered. So it was the Elise in France for a few years. And then we'll have the owners down here too and the year ranges that they owned that the vessel. Uh, so this one's cool because it has colorized postcards in it. This is one of the first ones I added more images for because this is one of the ones where they found a lot of debris. So like 
you know, ores and debris from the Regina, Regina and the Wexford after the great storm. So that's a, yeah, that's a great one. I, that's why I picked this one because it has, it has the, the two sailors who washed up as well. And she wasn't found all that long ago, as I recall. I no. remember when we found her and the, the debris from the Regina and the Wexford was sort of intermixed and they thought the two vessels might've collided. I think was the story. I don't remember fully, but it's, yeah, I think so. It's definitely possible. Like, I mean, given the weather conditions, I don't think that was the case. I think that's what they assumed at the time because the debris had been in her, in her, in her, in her, yeah. In her mind. But yeah, very, very cool database. This is, uh, you know, a really great source for, you know, particularly the photos. I'm so happy to hear that there are multiple photos now. Yeah, being able to put it and they'll just be as you know, a little film strip here at the top. And then you can click on it or you can open it another tab and look at the, you know, any metadata that was on it. Because we do have a lot of them that are unlabeled for date and location. Um, let's go on to the ports data, or you can also search owner separately too, which is pretty neat, but we'll go on to the personnel database. So the basis for this one was, if anyone's familiar with the Great Lakes Red Books, those were published every year starting in 1899, I want to say, and it has, it lists all the Great Lakes fleets, all the vessels and all the fleets, who the captains were and who the chief engineers were. So they recorded all that information in here. Now I'm going to pick a funny name. So I actually had to help someone look for a guy named Captain Picard. So for all you Star Trek fans out there, <laughs> uh, and there's actually quite a few of them. Uh, his name was Russell Russell Picard, someone who served with him. Uh, so here's what you get for this particular person. So we've got several five years of entries in the directories of the International Shipmasters Association. So those are included Ooh, as well. Is, is that a different pop up? Oh. <sighs> I keep forgetting that it shares a new window. Let's do this. There we go. There we go. All right. So, so there's five entries from the um, International Shipmasters Association database. So if you click in, it has the date, uh, his rank, if he's active or not, the pennant number, what lodge he was a part of, and a lot of times it has the address too. So this has been really helpful for people doing genealogy, finding out where their family lived. Because someone would contact me and say, hey, I found out my grandpa was in the Pittsburgh steamship fleet or something like that. And then we can we can research those. And then a few other Great Lakes periodicals, old ones, the Great Lakes News and the Great Lakes Review and the Pittsburgh steamship uh, captain's appointments. Those are all included in this database as well. There's a lot more sources that need to be included. Um, so that's a very one of my many long term projects to increase the amount of personnel records in here because there's yeah, there's nothing like this. You have to physically go through all of them to look for what you wanted otherwise. What a, what a great resource. I've got all those red books. You can see them on the shelf behind me when I had my picture up. And it's a nightmare, you know, to have to search through every year. And you've got this yep. all compiled. So you know, really an important source. They got a lot of grants, uh, I think, from the National Endowment for the Humanities and from the Ohio Sea Grant to do this, these databases. Uh, I'm going to share another tab again. So this is the ports database. So I'll, this is gonna be all photographs. I'll point out that this is all Ohio because it was funded by Ohio Sea Grant and they wouldn't do anything other than Ohio ports. <laughs> oh. So, and there'll be more pictures to add as we get more. So everything from Middle Bass Island to Sandusky to, I know they say Milan here, it drives me crazy, but it's Milan, Michigan too, which I believe at its height in the mid 19th, early mid 19th century, Milan was the biggest shipbuilding port on the Great Lakes. So that's pretty fun. Uh, so this is just, we have tons of port photographs. They're just alphabetical by uh, port name. Everything from South Manitou Island to Cleveland to, uh, of course, Toledo being the biggest because we're right next to it. We're about 20 miles south. Uh, so it's pretty similar to the vessel database photographs where it says, you know, here's the picture, here's what was written on it for a description, uh, what city and what the original size is of it. That's standard things to include for archival description for photographs. People want to sometimes want to know what the original was because then they can find out, oh, that's why this picture is so blurry because it was tiny. They can't blow it up any more than this. Sure. Um, so, yeah. And this looks so much better than our old port. Our old port database was just a list of cities, whereas our web developer was able to make this a, a gallery where you can look at them all. It's really neat. Very um, cool. So glad I work at a place with a web developer so I don't have to do all this myself. <laughs> uh, I want to share one quick final thing from the screen share here uh, from the website. 
So underneath that, there's also a, I won't click on this, but there's all the different abbreviations for countries and things. Because some vessels ended up like, oh, this destroyer escort was built in Bay City, and then it ended up with the Chilean Navy or something like that. Or the you know Toledo Shipbuilding actually built a frigate for the Royal Thai Navy. I don't know how they Toledo got a Thai Navy contract, but apparently it was good. Um, a list of all the manuscript collections that we have processed are available here. Is available here. I'm going to share the tab because it opened a new one. So. It gives you a brief description of all of them and any all these orange numbers are just the collection numbers and you can click on those uh so like we can go dry it out uh, you've got the eric heil papers i didn't realize that yep that's a really important collection uh oh what happened to the tab yeah the it, it, tab on, it disappeared on my end too mark you could just share it again i got it here it comes give it a second yep. cool yeah, so it gives you kind of introduction, where we got it from, uh, you know, a biographical sketch of a person. If it's an organization or company, there'll be some company history here. Uh, scope and content is just kind of a high level overview of what's in it. And then you can get into the nitty gritty of here's the different kinds of things that are actually here, like his vessel histories. He did a great six volume book set called uh, Early American Steamers. Yep. Not just Great Lakes steamers, but across the United States. So kind of, especially pre-1850. Uh, so it's a really great source for that. And the last box in the collection has a bunch of pen and ink sketches he did of them, which are great. Yeah. They're in color. Um, he also did a lot of wreck lists, uh, annual yeah, lists, did. early <laughs> annual lists of every shipwreck on the lakes. And I have his bound, a bound copy of his wreck lists. I mean, the guy was just a, a, an amazing, amazing a marine artist and researcher early you know he died in i think 72. i'm really uh, glad you have his collection yeah. yeah he passed let's see yeah he was born in 1887 and passed away in 1970 uh and passed away in 1973. so yeah he mm -hmm. was 90, or 89 85 years old so mm -hmm. he went from he was born in the gilded age and died during vietnam so that's quite the he saw a lot yeah, um, his, his, it's amazing that, that all of these things are preserved in one place too, and that's at Bowling Green. And uh, you know, just uh, and it's not just him. You have Arthur and Lucy Fredrickson's papers there too. Yeah, we have Fredrickson stuff um, and a, couple, a few other things that came later from a guy named Grant Brown who did a book called uh, he did a book about the Ann Arbor Car Ferries. Yep, and he donated all of his research product to us. But he also had some unseen a uh, handful of unseen Fredrickson photographs, so we got those as well, wow. which is fantastic. But you, yeah, and the nice thing is, so many of these companies, if you Google it, usually our finding aid will be one of the first results you get. So, look at how long that list is. I mean, that list is. is, is it's is huge. <laughs> and there's a lot of gaps. I mean, it goes all the way down to uh, the logbook collection, Muskegon Custom Service records. So, a bunch of the, all of our custom service records, except for Grand Haven, are, the microfilm was digitized. So, eventually, we'll be able to have that up so you can just download the PDF of. You know, let's say, you know, vessel mortgages for mosquitoes or something like that. So, wow. all right, let's go to. So, I have a lot more time on the website, but I want to be mindful of the time. So, yep. I'll hop to uh, the screen here. So, yeah, I think we were going to go through, um, we were going to look at some of the uh, other collections that you have there, right? And we were going to give us a little bit of a guided tour. Mm hmm. All right. Oh, oh, sure. Sure. Oh, look at that perspective there. Uh, Let's try it again. Okay, thanks. I'm trying to figure out. How, okay, there we go. Presentation. Here it comes. Full screen. Yay, it's branded. I had a limited images at my disposal, so I had to kind of mess with what I had. Um, so just for fun, the vessel image in the picture is the um the mississippi which was built in 1853 this is a picture of it at uh fort wayne there in detroit in the 1850s i believe laid up there for quite a while i just like the picture because it's really neat so i just took a few snapshots of some when i was in the office on monday so this is the first row of the manuscript collections so they're on what we call mobile shelving. So the shelving is on tracks. And so when you're not using it, you turn the cranks and all the shelves compress together. So there's no gaps in between. So you maximize space. Um, 
So this is the very, very end. Some of the collections that can't read the labels, but the Chicago Shipbuilding Company collection is here. Toledo Port Authority, that's one of our active, our, one of our five active collections is the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority, the Eric Heil collections up here. Um, here's some of the books, like I mentioned, two to 3,000 books. And some of them are multi-volume, like the Lake Carriers Association annual reports, um, you know, Lloyd's Register of Yachts, you know, map and chart books, especially from the 20th century, local history, Native American history, and the environment, labor history, all that, all the stuff that's intertwined with Great Lakes Maritime history in general. Wow. And I like, I like, this is a good example from the pamphlets and report. So there was a guy named uh, Henry Good. He was the fish, fish commissioner for the United States government in the 1880s. And he, he compiled this great study of fisheries of the United States. And there's a subsection just for the Great Lakes. So there's this whole section of these amazing lithographs of sort of late 19th century fishing practices. So like this is South Manitou fishing camp here. Uh, so you've got the gill nets, you've got the boats, and then they have a little shanty where they clean fish and then they go back to the mainland or they would camp out depending on the season time and the time. So, but they show how they use gill nets, how they use capture nets in the Detroit River. A lot of them were adapted from native fishing methods, which is really interesting. Yeah, that's a whole other subject area that we can talk a lot, <laughs> I have a lot about is uh, uh, fishing history of the Great Lakes. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, pamphlets and reports can be all kinds of things from a little two pager, uh, you know, Cedar Point ferry brochure to, uh, you know, a dissertation on the social history of sailing. Um, also have a pretty big periodical collection. It's about 100 titles, I believe. A lot of them are discontinued. The one I have as an example, this isn't Great Lakes specific, but I'm keeping the early 20th century ones, Motor Boating Magazine, because they had a watercolor artist who did a special cover every month. Well, those are really collectible too. There's a huge group of yeah. collectors for that. So this is Venice, for example, uh, and it was fifty cents in 1927. So I, I looked at that, and that's like seven dollars now for one issue. Uh, yeah. So that shows you. But I mean, periodicals like you know, with soundings from Wisconsin and inland sea, inland seas and telescope and uh, you know, a large number, especially some that were very short lived. Uh, some of the wartime bulletins for the shipping company, shipbuilding companies, things like that. So it's a huge variety and they're all in the catalog. So it's one, always something you can search or you just bug me in directly instead, which is just fine. And those they're periodicals fine. are an astounding source for shipwreck research, you know, oh, in yes. and telescope and, and hard, inland seas is, is digitized, but telescope, I have the run. There's no other way to do it other than the brute force, read them through. And uh, the, the I think Walter has been doing some of that. Actually. Yeah. They're really important. There's, you know, as every shipwreck on the lakes was discovered, they would cover it and write articles about how, who discovered it and how. Uh, just yeah, or someone did an article because they were interested and you find out, oh, finally, if I can find out all this legwork was done for me already. Yeah. And then you can go out there with modern technology and figure out what they could in, honest, in all honesty. So, yeah, uh, this is, we have a lot of logbooks scattered across collections. Um, this is just one that's a main logbook collection. It's mainly 20th century, especially like post-war. Uh, the one that's gotten the most use are the Joseph H. Thompson logs because they cover the 1970s. So it was one of the vessels that was searching for the Fitzgerald when it went down. Uh, so one of our regular researchers who comes in uh, from Lorraine, he was the dispatcher at the time. So he gets a kick out of seeing his name in the, seeing yourself in a historical record is a very powerful thing. So <laughs> he loves it when he comes in and does that. Um, and luckily someone did, a, some poor student must have gotten this job before I was here. So every single log book has a sheet in it with which vessel it was, what kind of log it is, and what year span is covered, if known. So yeah, that's great. But for, for this group's purposes, it probably wouldn't be as interesting because most of it's 1940s and later, 1940s to 1970s. Um, but I still wanted to point out because I think it's cool. Well, I know you guys do have a couple of old log books there. Yeah, we do. And there's some older ones in the collection. The oldest one I know we have is from the Great Lakes Historical Society collection. And that's from the Brig Columbia. And it's from 1855. Wow. So it was the year she was the first vessel to open the locks at Sault Ste. Marie ever. Um, but it's, of course, it's from the year after that. We can't, can't all be lucky, right? <laughs> uh, so this is the most used part of the collection. This is the photographs. So the Island in the middle there, I call the island. That's from the photographs that came from the Great Lakes Historical Society. 
and all the rest of the outside except for one cabinet which is microfilm the rest of that is all photos so there's people photos there's ports there's subjects uh, but mostly vessels i lost count but there's i think 64 drawers of vessel photographs and it's alphabetical by the original name just like the vessel database is so as you imagine that's the most frequent thing that gets used because people just want photographs from model building or just because they like a particular boat or their dad was on it you know or they're doing shipwreck research so you know someone like jerry eliason contacts me and i'll say well i've got plans here's the plans for the hudson and then here's some reference photographs so you can see what it looked like so in its life. Before you, it, one of the things i wanted to also point out the great lakes historical society you know that was at vermilion ohio for it was the oldest historical society on the Great Lakes with a huge collection of material and probably one of the most earliest and most important collections. That's all there now at Bowling Green, isn't it? Yep. Uh, almost every, they retained their log books, ship plans, and artwork, but otherwise everything else came to us, especially the photographs. So I guess the, those get the most use. And you can't see it, but on the other side of the those island cabinets, there's a five and a half foot tall wooden uh, homemade cabinet with open drawers and it's the Milton Brown scrapbook collection. They're just massive scrapbooks of early to mid 20th century vessel photography. And they're, every single one is labeled with date, location, all that stuff. It's amazing. They've got some really cool stuff and some glass plates that I got to go through still. Wow. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Then they've got the the Dana Bowen negative collection that some people may have heard of. So that's pretty famous. Um, let's see, I'll move on here. There's just a fun example photo. That's the, the steamer Atlantic. And it's it's stuck in the ice, so everyone went out to play, basically. <laughs> yep. Yep. Detroit, Saginaw, Sheboygan, Alpena, Oscoda, Port Huron, Detroit, and Cleveland. So they and Mackinac Island. So they had quite the uh, quite the range. We have charts as well, but given that, and Brendan shared this on the group on Facebook as well, uh, that NOAA has digitized almost all of their historical charts. So most of what we have is moot at this point, but I still thought I'd point out a couple that I didn't find there. We have maybe 10 that aren't on the NOAA database. Well, you guys also have a lot of those Corps of Engineers charts, and it, <coughs> one of them, I think, that are not on the NOAA database. You know, so yeah. you a lot of stuff that's not up there yet, particularly those harbor charts and survey charts. Yeah, the harbor charts are great. And some of the earliest harbor charts are Buffalo and Sandusky. Sandusky was founded in 1818, so it's the oldest Ohio Great Lakes port by, well, Perrysburg says they were 1813, but there was just a fort there, so they don't. I don't count that. Well, but this I particular to, chart, this is Detroit River, 1842. Yeah, and I have to um, give you my, uh, my 1829 charts of uh, yeah, I know, Ohio right. and Dunkirk yet. Um, I have. I'm going to show you my, my favorite insert. There's no warnings anywhere else in this entire chart about obstructions except for this one on the Canadian shore. It says a dangerous rock in front of Dougal's dwelling at 375 feet from the shore, only six feet of water on top and 24 all around it. So there's just a rock, but they don't notice, they don't know any other obstructions in the entire river, which I find very unusual. I just think it's funny that did this guy know the person who drew the chart said, hey, don't forget that rock you guys almost hit. I'm sure that's what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's my guess. You know, he sent him a, a Pony Express message and yeah, that's great. So this is this is going back to Dr. Wright again. So every every binder you see on the shelf is a, a scrapbook of newspapers. There's five hundred and fifty-five of them wow. from eighteen nineteen to nineteen eighty seven. And it's all chron completely chronological. There's no chronological overlap. And it covers he must have had a lot of newspaper subscriptions, but people also sent them because we have Buffalo newspapers. Toronto, Vermilion, Cleveland, Toledo, Detroit, Bay City, uh, Roger City, Duluth, Chicago, Green Bay, Milwaukee, you know, it's the whole lakes and some Canadian ones as well. What time period? Uh, 1819 to 1987. They pretty much stopped when he passed away. So, so he's he got all the new microfilm, like, like all the <laughs> microfilm, he copied microfilms and bound them. From the no, most of these are originals. They're originals? Like, yeah, so for example, let's go to the next page. So I scanned, I brought this one home to scan. So that's a Buffalo Patriot from 19, 1825. Um, so there's, there's, there's transcripts, there's photocopies, but a lot of originals, and I'm impressed by the condition. So I, we used to have a conservator, and I said, well, how did he do this? And the best we can figure out is it's extremely diluted Elmer's, which is 
because glue is naturally acidic. Yeah. So uh, it's it was diluted to make it just sticky enough to adhere the paper, but not enough to. There's no bleed through either, which I can't. It must have been done with a paintbrush, I think. So he did this in his basement. Doctor Wright apparently his wife made him go sit in the basement to do these, so he couldn't use the dining room, use up the dining room table. So Martha would send him to the basement, and so apparently he would just do in the evenings. He would do these while listening to Red Wings games. So wow. <laughs> my favorite ship list here. It's a ship that arrived. The schooner Lycerty, L I C E R T Y. Master was Duncan from Erie, cargo of whiskey and apples. <laughs> I can get behind that cargo. <laughs> Yeah, so, and a lot of these early ones is, is canal discussions because there was so much speculation on who's going to do the canals because the Erie Canal had just come out and they were thinking about how to connect the Ohio River to the Great Lakes system and eventually the Mississippi River to the Great Lakes system. So there's a lot of canal talk. Wow. Um, but this is a great source too. And I would, I mean, most of it is, most of the stuff is post, is like Civil War era and later, but there's a couple volumes of pre 1860s. So, I just, I'm amazed that this is almost 200 years old and it's in this condition still. I mean, I have a paper that I got in grad school that's yellow already. I had no idea that the scrapbook collection was that large or that it was original or that it went back that far. That's I didn't know it was that big till I had my student add them all into a finding aid. And she's like, yeah, there were 550 files. <laughs> she, she took her tablet PC back in the stacks and was able to enter them into an inventory. What a goal. Um, and I bet you half of it's never been gone through since since Wright made it. Probably. And then we have a whole separate subset of five boxes of just Buffalo newspaper excerpts from 1835 to 1910, I believe. I'll be posting a lot of this stuff. I'll post links to a lot of this later so I don't have to go into detail and so everyone can go take a look. Very cool. Um, and then on film, we have 300 rolls of film that cover the most of the 19th century for Buffalo and Toronto. So... There's a lot there. And the schooner days, if some of you have heard of those, we have almost a complete run of schooner days as well. C.H.J. Snyder's uh, column from the Toronto Globe. Mm -hmm. um, and they're amazing. There's they, they, a lot of interviews, because it was done from the 30s to the yep. 50s, so a lot of interviews with old timers. It's gems, lots of folklore type stuff and anecdotes, but you can get a lot of good information too. Very cool. Let's see. This one I'll go by real quick. So you may notice if you've ever used the Jerry Metzler database at the Wisconsin Maritime Museum, they have their sources at the bottom. And one of the things they mention is John Poole's notes. So he has a 60,000 uh, index card collection of vessel information. This is the front of one. So you can tell how fun the handwriting is because uh, this is much bigger than the original half this size. And some of them he wrote even smaller. So the example I use, if any of you who were math aficionados, if you had a class, you or a classmate who was able to write compound fractions on one line, John was one of those guys. Uh -huh. <laughs> you could do the tiny print. Um, but that's great for the old sailing vessels too. I picked a 20th century steamer, but uh, but having the sailing vessels too, it gives you the particulars, any known collisions, uh, dispositions, other accidents that it may have had, or any notable activity. So that was a, a one of many sources that Gerald Metzler used to create mm -hmm set of bigger set of notes, which were then used to create the Wisconsin database. So and Poole, Poole also made rec lists too, really good rec lists. I, I have a copy yeah, of that. Yeah. Uh, he was a compatriot of Herman Rungi's, a really important uh, collection that you've got there for, re for shipwreck researchers. I agree. It's really something. Uh, one other main one that I want to bring up is the Loudon Wilson collection. So he was a Marine artist uh, starting in the thirties. He, well, he got a job working in it. He was from Scotland, but he moved to the U.S. after his father died. Uh, but he was by the Clyde, if anyone knows, the famous huge shipbuilding area in Great Britain. Uh, but he was a marine artist and also very, very interested in 19th century sailing vessels. That's his specific area of interest. So he wrote several large, just these notebook, huge notebooks, like inch or two thick of all these handwritten notes. And a lot of it are interviews that he did with captains, retired schooner captains in the thirties. Oh, so for example, he has a whole, this whole little section just on how Manitowoc built schooners were different than schooners built other places. They had the rubbing streak that ones built other places may not have had, which is really interesting. So wow. he used this example of the Asolda Bach built at Manitowoc 1881. Uh, and he has this little note. This feature is noted in several vessels of Manitowoc origin. This guy, Captain John Thurston, he references a lot, says this was true of the schooner George W. Bissell, but then he has an asterisk at the bottom where it was built. Um, 
Yeah, it's amazing. He did a lot of interviews with these guys, especially guys mm -hmm. who, who worked on the ship their whole careers and would sketch out things for them. And then he would draw nicer versions to use in his notebook. So it's here's something that uh, the, I pulled the box that you just showed there. I just finished yeah. writing her up. She was lost at uh, Beaver Island. I've never seen that photo before. So I'll definitely want to make use of it. Yeah, and that's a handwritten sketch that he made based on if he saw photos or artwork or sketches at the time that may not exist anymore, he would make his own version of it. He would kind of synthesize his sources and make one image. So here's a good example. Uh, he's showing the difference of lumber hookers built uh, in different areas. So there's a Lucia Simpson. That's a pretty famous one. I've heard that name mentioned a lot. Yeah. Bill and Walk. From a WW photo, maybe William Warden possibly, but I don't know. But it's saying, oh, yeah, if it's built here, it has spreaders. If it's built in Manitowoc, it doesn't. So it's really, here's another good one. I mean, his, and I really appreciate his handwriting. His cursive and print is impeccable. I mean, look at this sail diagram. His detail is amazing. Wow. Um, I've never I mean, this seen is, this before. That's as described by Captain John Thurston. So uh, that's that was standard rigging for a Great Lakes bark in the 19th century. I, I uh, have one of uh, Wilson's. Um, I have one of his one of his books, but I've never seen these. Yeah, there's he kind of copied out various like small subsets of it, but I don't think it was. I think he meant to do it as a book, and it never happened. So I think that'd be a great thing for a really hardcore editor, a group of editors out there to kind of go through it and make like a really big, thick, definitive title on the technical aspects of Great Lakes Sail, especially in how it differs from Ocean Sail. Um, this is my favorite image from the collection, um, it's, which it was more than one page, but he actually did these color ink drawings of the decorations on the, the sterns of the of schooners. I love it. And how colorful it used to be because you lose so much in the black and white, you know, unless you see a painting or something. Uh, this is great. I mean, he has ones from Kingston, from Buffalo, from Michigan City, Indiana, um, and gives you an idea of the artwork that would be in the back. Like the Midland Rover has a deer on it. And then the Kuwaitan has like the Michigan, kind of like the Michigan seal. Another one has the fleur de lis on it. You know, the color and the livery of them is beautiful because it's so hard to tell in a black and white picture. I mean, this is some of the only ways we'll ever know what the livery of those ships were, especially because so many were independently owned back then. That was your family business, right? Or a couple of guys get together and pool money. And yeah, so this gives you an idea of those what those stern decks. Some of them are very plain and some are ostentatious. So one has a beaver. The St. Louis has a beaver on it. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's such a great image. I never get tired of that one. So we always trot that out for... I have a folder on our server called Greatest Hits, and that's in there. <laughs> the stuff you show off. Um, the last big one I'll mention before we switch back to face-to-face -to -face, sort of is the, the American Shipbuilding Company collection. And that's mainly we got the vast majority of their ship drawings in the early 90s when they shut down all operations. Um, so most of those original drawings and some from Great Lakes Engineering Works as well because Amship was able to get those when glue closed in 1962. Um, we don't have all of them. The Great Lakes Historical Society has about a third, and we have about two thirds. And I think Detroit Historical Society has a smattering too. Um, but we have a lot of them on microfilm. We filmed ours and Great Lakes Historical Societies. A lot of the, not all the drawings, but most of them from up to 1920 back in the 80s. And that's been digitized. So that's what I'm providing to people right now. Someone says, hey, do you have plans for the city of Erie, for example? I can send those right over. It's not ideal because of how big the originals are. Uh, for example, I'm going to go ahead. So this is the promenade deck for the Greater Buffalo, and the original is 12 feet long. Uh, it's just massive. They're so, and I don't even have a table long enough. I have to go to a different floor just to unroll it all the way. Wow. Uh, but I'll go back just for some examples. Like I posted these on the Great Lakes Shipping History Group today. The uh, whale back, Joseph Colby, which was hall number 108 from Superior. But it has not only the deck plans, which have... Uh, they even put the little uh, buttons in the bunks, that kind of detail. Uh, but then you go to the next page, and they actually did some of the interiors. I mean, this is just sideboard. This was just their dining room. Look wow. how crazy that is. <laughs> so some of them have great interior detail, especially those passenger ships, which are my favorite, uh, because they had all that mahogany woodwork and gas lighting, and which I can't see how that would have gone wrong on wooden vessels, but... Um, so that's a huge collection. I won't spend much more time on it because it's basically people can just contact me and say, hey, I have a list of what halls we have. Uh, for just for Amship and predecessors, we have 2,100 tubes of them. Uh, 
some of them are a lot like the greater buffalo because all the conversion to an aircraft carrier as well uh, but some of the more we have some famous ones like we have the last thousand footer built in lorraine and we have the edmund fitzgerald and uh notice i have not brought up the edmund fitzgerald yet you're welcome everyone <laughs> there's so many more you know in this group there's so many more fascinating stories out there no yeah. just to the fitzgerald it just gets all the glory um this one real quick, this is the Vincent Nickerson collection. He was a marine artist active up until 1910. Most of his paintings don't survive or, or, or are in private hands, but we got his reference drawings. So for some 19th century vessels, you can get the color livery from that. So this is this is, this is depicting a, a generic Great Lakes 1900s yacht race. So Nickerson, yeah. Nickerson's yeah. artwork is priceless now. You know, they really go for a lot of money. I've appraised uh, at least one. We almost got one at a Cleveland art auction, but it went for six grand and we can only fork up three. That's but right. I won it because he did several that were night pictures and he would do them in pastel. And then for the moon, he would inset Mother of Pearl to make it glint. So yeah, that's a really great collection. So I'm gonna stop sharing there because I can talk for a long time and I wanna get to other things we may wanna talk about. So we are back on screen. Um... I don't want. <laughs> So, Mark, thanks so much for that tour. Yeah, honestly, uh, I had no idea there were all those hidden gems in the collection. That was really mind-blowing. And I've been there. I've used it. I've gone through the finding aids, and I thought I knew my way around that collection. Uh, I didn't know about half of it. That, um, and, and somebody said on the questions on the chat that we should do a part two because there was just so much. And I'm sure you, you know what? Like we, I can even do one on my own, just a, you know, a Zoom room or something, and we can chat about it. And I think I've added 20 more finding aids since I started. So a bunch of collections that were like low hanging fruit, you know, one box, for example, and then getting those out. But I'm like, you guys even put it all in folders, but you didn't put it online. So people know we have it. Yeah. You well, know, Mark, sort of cruise menus and stuff like that. We've got a collection yeah. of those. Those are fascinating. So we're, we're, we're just about out of time, but yeah. um, I wanted to uh, just mention a couple of, a couple of things. Uh, uh, Mark, how can people, number one, uh, make arrangements to use the collection? Number two, what's the best way to ask you uh, if they have a research uh, need? Best way right now is I'm spraying, which is just spring with an A, spraying M at bgsu.edu. Uh, or if you just go to the HCGL website, my contact information is in the sidebar. So mailing address if you want to randomly mail me something. But email is best right now for now, because I do get access to the building once a week, so I can still work on queries for people right now. Sure, very cool. So we've got the URLs. I got a couple of quick housekeeping things before we wrap up. Uh, sure. Number one, I want to remind everybody, we're about to do a Zoom room as soon as we get out of here. And uh, Mark, are you going to be able to join us? No, yes, of course, I'll be there. Excellent. Um, so uh, if you guys want to chat, we're all going to be there. Uh, join us. Uh, the link is out there. I think the room is just open. You don't need a password. I think you can just come right on in. I'm going to open it up as soon as I get off of here. Also, this show is going to be uploaded to our YouTube channel, uh, the recording of this, and you can share it elsewhere if you'd like. Um, and come on in next week for Valerie Van Heest. Uh, it should be a great shipwreck show. Uh, she's done. People I've like worked with several times, and I haven't met her yet, and I need to meet her sometime. I just need to go to Holland, I guess. <laughs> she's, she's 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 an impressive person. So, um, Mark, thank you so much for doing sure. this and for taking the time and showing us this really mind-boggling collection. Um, and for those of us who research Great Lakes shipwrecks, it is just kind of the mecca, uh, really, in many ways. So, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, we will be on the Zoom room in about three minutes. All right. Can Good I add something really quick? What, what's yeah, that? I was just going to say, don't. No question. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Don't think that you're taking up my time because my job is to preserve and promote collections and help people do research. It's my entire job. I'm not the one out in the water. You guys are. So I'm just so everyone else. Well, thank you so much again for being here. Good night, everybody.